Eleanor Dowdy is a multifaceted artist, author, and illustrator who have tried different creative paths. She took the risk, did a detour, and even took the road less traveled, which includes windows and walls. Definitely an episode you don't want to miss. Join us as we talk about tips for painting a large-scale art piece, such as mural, lessons for painting sky for 31 straight days, who your most important client is, and why language of color is important. If you want to be part of the conversation, then send in your questions and topics you want us to cover to hello at etcherlab.com. Hey, this is Jesse from Etcher. We believe in your power to create, so we invited artists from all around the globe to inspire you to keep on creating. Join us in this journey and let's celebrate creativity. This is Make More Art, the podcast. was always the art kid for like as long as I can remember. I started by drawing Digimon characters for my friends in like third grade. Okay. So I was a little nerd. Um, I also was lucky to be exposed to studio Ghibli movies at a young age because oh. we had a family friend mm -hmm. who gave them to us on VHS. So I would watch all those over and over and they're such beautiful movies. Um, I feel like they had something to do with it. So I was into all kinds of creative stuff. It wasn't just drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. It was like photography, um, like building things out of wood, just learning new skills. Um, I had some supportive art teachers in high school, um, but Drawing and painting was really special for me, I think, because I could just do it anywhere all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that was what I really wanted to do, but I didn't know what career that mm -hmm. would mean for me. Yeah. So really what I wanted to do was go to art school and meet all the other art kids like me. And I didn't have a plan <clears throat> after that so much. I figured that it would it would work out once mm -hmm. I got to that point. Right. I went through an illustration program at a large public um, state university, Virginia Commonwealth University, in my home state of Virginia. I decided that I didn't want to do illustration as my career because I was very very anxious when I had to make something for somebody else. Oh, even just small commissions. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh no, it <laughs> has to be the best thing ever. And it's like not fun in the way that just making stuff for myself is fun. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I don't want to like kill this love for making pictures. So I'm going to be a window display designer. Um, <laughs> Cause I love like, immersive sculptural experiences and mm -hmm. just the when you do window displays you're like working with power tools and making different things every day so you're always learning things I think that's really important to me but then eventually I was still freelancing a little bit mm -hmm. and eventually I kind of just happened to move from um like jobs being an employee to being a part-time employee to being a consultant okay. and then just doing art <laughs> so okay. it just worked out hey follow up question to that um so you you're doing this full-time now yes oh, okay so the transition so you said that okay so you managed to get into university right um an, an art program illustration mm -hmm. But then you realize that it's not something that you wanted to do, uh, specifically on the aspect that if you're doing it for someone else, so it takes a little bit of the fun out of that. Mm -hmm. And so you made the decision to be a window display artist. Is, is that right? So the ones that we right. see on the, on the malls or any like marketing thingy, that's, that's what you did before. Yeah, well, that's what I wanted to do. Um, um, I really wanted to work for anthropology. Oh, um, yeah. Amazing, amazing mm -hmm. displays all the time, and it's a full-time mm -hmm. position to, to do that. I'm like, wow, that sounds great. I get a regular paycheck. Yeah. It looks really interesting and, and all that. 
So, and I just felt like the amount of struggling I, I had to do to make a, like an illustration for someone else wasn't mm -hmm. worth the money and like you know our teachers were pretty real with us they're like this is not the easy path to take mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in art and a lot of people will not continue on this path and I was like well I mean there's lots of ways to to be an artist and to enjoy making art you yeah. don't have to do it full-time that's true that is mm -hmm. so true now after that gig with a windows play and and all that what happened what happened next um so it was kind of funny it was like a life lesson that mm -hmm. if you don't take control of your you don't like steer your ship okay it's gonna go somewhere where you don't necessarily want it to go it's like the currents of life mm -hmm. pushing you around so i started wanting to do window display but there's also this thing called visual merchandising, which is how you arrange products in a store to get people to buy them. Mm -hmm. and I was like, I don't really care about this, but I have to do it because that's what like employers need. Obviously, they need to sell stuff. So I was um, recruited to be a visual merchandising consultant okay. for like a skincare store. And it wasn't very creative, but it did pay really well. And so I had to work less for the same amount of money. And they also sent me around the country to these malls to open stores, which was cool because I was working like 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. shift. So got some sleep and then I got to go into the city and explore wherever I was. Sometimes it was like interesting places and sometimes it was less interesting places but all places are kind of interesting okay. I was excited for all of it mm -hmm. so I did that for like a year along with some other gigs freelancing until that company got bought by some Brazilian corporation and then they just stopped hiring me okay <laughs> just like bye <laughs> so I was like I'll get a job I had moved to Seattle by that point mm -hmm. there's a lot less um store display work here um so I was trying to get a job but nothing was really working and around that time um my illustration work started picking up a lot more so take me it through, worked out. yeah take me to that point um because when you when you were sharing I was like okay um I'm glad that you were trying out different things and exploring um and that really shows you know, I know a lot of creative people and that's really you know you're you're always curious right and you said mm -hmm. initially you were anxious of doing something that's commissioned um because it takes away the fun of doing of creating but then you became a window display artist and that was that was okay um mm -hmm. right but then you know different <laughs> It's a friend, yeah. So you yeah. started to explore those things, but then I, when I was looking at your portfolio, I saw that you know you've been you've been hired by different brands and you have done editorials as well. Take me through that the journey of how you ended up doing those things. Um, yeah, the editorial was. I had a very nice recurring gig with. Um, Vice. It was a subsection of the site called Broadly. I don't even know if it exists anymore, but it was like mm -hmm. women's issues and stuff like that. So I did like 70 illustration commissions for them. Wow. And for illustration work, it was like pretty good money and like two day jobs. And those were really challenging um, and sometimes really fast turnaround jobs. I don't think I would do as many nowadays okay. <laughs> um yeah I was just referred to them by a friend who was writing for them mm -hmm. and she recommended me they needed an illustrator really last minute mm -hmm. and she texted me and so I got to do that and then they just kept hiring me um mm -hmm. until again like something happened to the site and I just stopped getting calls 
which is something you have to kind of plan for as a freelancer, like mm-hmm. no guarantees of anything. So it's good to have a lot of things going on in different um, aspects. So if something falls through, you're not panicking. Yeah. <laughs> that took me a long time to get mm-hmm. to like, oh, this is never going to get a job again. Like, no, there's, there's lots of jobs out there, but sometimes they just, they come to you. Mm-hmm. Your um, style, um, Ellender, was it something that, because you mentioned that as a kid, right? You've, you've always been creative, making things, mm-hmm. doing a lot of things, right? But it's, it's the drawing, the pain that's illustrating, that's special for you. And how did you realize that that was really something that you wanted to um, push through in your, I mean, as, as a career, rather than something that you're just going to do on the side as a hobby? What was, mm-hmm. was there a turning point that this is really what I wanted to do? Um, and at this point that you're doing this full time, what was that turning point in your career that made you decide that, Okay, I'm going to go full on to this 100%. And this is the style that I'm going to do and use. Mm. Yeah, a big turning point was definitely when my commissions became focused on location illustration and Mm -hmm. urban sketching Mm -hmm. um, instead of like being a generalist and doing these editorial illustrations for news articles and stuff like that so I think that really happened when I think a few things happened um I discovered the urban sketchers organization Mm -hmm. and um just like there's this huge community around around that and it wasn't just like the little groups I had with my friends it was something way bigger yeah um seeing how much potential there is um, this company called Indie Walls, who sets up artists with hotels and restaurants and stuff like that to get art into spaces, put me on a roster for True Hilton, which is a line of Hilton hotels. Each one of these hotels gets a large scale illustration in their lobby, and it's unique based on which hotel it is and that was a really awesome gig because it was let me do like landscape illustrations for um lots of different places the pay is pretty good and then my work gets to be like in a hotel lobby for lots of people to see it and that was a turning point because i realized that there's demand for the kind of work that i really want to make that feels like Mm -hmm. me and what I'm really interested in. Yeah. But the, the gig would held in, did they give you creative freedom? Because you mentioned that it's different for each hotel, right? But did you have mm-hmm. creative freedom to really let loose and inject your style um, while also considering their theme for that hotel? Yeah. Um, so they choose me out of like one, maybe 10 other artists because the owners resonate with my style in some ways. So I'm really encouraged to make it look like my own work and not like anyone else's work. But of course, each owner has um, different levels of wanting to be involved in the process. Okay. So yeah, sometimes they, they have an idea of what they really want. And some people are just like, do what you think is best. Okay. Uh, those are the type of clients that you would like to have, right? You have creative freedom to really incorporate your own style. Yes. Um, for sure. is, yeah. Do you still do commission works or what are the usual works that you do nowadays, given that you're doing it full time? Yeah. Well, with um, COVID being in the place where it is, things are picking back up right mm-hmm. now. Yeah. So right now I'm working on some more online courses and I'm working on um, a mural design that I'm going to be painting in my city and also a large scale illustration that will be in a elementary school in Virginia of an it's like specific to the place 
So I'm really happy to have this illustration, location illustration niche here. I like that. Illust location yeah. illustration niche. It's very niche down. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We, you talk about like you, you were saying mural earlier, and then I know that you do a lot of like small, like not really large pieces of art. Yeah. Um, for a lot of people, like personally, I except for the fact that I try to save on paper because um, watercolor paper can be very expensive, especially mm -hmm. those one, the cotton ones, the 300 GSM. What's your piece of advice if, if someone is like, like I personally don't um, paint a lot on like large scale. Um, I don't do a lot of large scale paintings or, or drawings um, because having a blank page is already scary and intimidating and make it like bigger <laughs> sort of doubles that intimidation. Yes. So what is yeah. your piece of advice given that you have done, you sort of tried basically the small ones, the bigger ones, and now you're talking about murals and school yeah. buildings. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> it is intimidating for sure. I still mm -hmm. get intimidated by this. A lot of those are digital, so I don't really have to worry about wasting paper or mm -hmm. um, I have like so much control over how it looks. Yeah. So, but when I'm doing a mural painted directly on a surface is pretty um, nerve wracking <laughs> to start off. But the best advice I have would be to do a full rendering of the, the piece, but on a small piece of paper. At a small scale, you can just change it to be on a large scale. Mm -hmm. And it's really important when you're painting the mural to just stay with the plan that you have on your small piece, on your sketches and your like your design guide. Because mm -hmm. if you do that, then it's it's gonna be all good. Just oh. a lot larger. I was actually thinking, so to ask you whether do you have the plan in mind already and have that laid out or in the middle of the mural do you change or alter or made some modifications in the you know but you just said that make sure that you have everything laid out already and stick with the plan yeah definitely <laughs> stick with the plan um for a few reasons one is if you screw up or it doesn't look good at that scale you're gonna have to read like redo it all and yeah. it can take a really long time at that scale mm -hmm. and also if you're doing a mural you've or for a lot of them you've gotten this approved by multiple people and potentially like the city or whatever and they are not going to be happy if you change the design okay <laughs> what than that what would you mm -hmm. say is the most challenging project that you have done so far hmm Oh, they're all a little challenging. Let's see. And a follow-up question to that probably is, what is that one project that you enjoy the most doing? Let's look at my website. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually in the so work earlier. Look at your portfolio, yeah. Maybe ones that you, I have like this strong sense of how I want it to look, mm. but it doesn't ever get there. And I'm I spend so much time like trying to get it to look how I want it to look and it just doesn't get there. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that usually happens when I don't have the plan. Okay. I, all that pressure just made it like not come out very mm -hmm. easily. And I didn't really know what I wanted it to be. And that's makes it really hard if you don't even know what you're trying to do. So plan is very, very important. Would you yes. say, um, I was browsing through your some of your works earlier and there's this post um, where it's a huge piece of art and it's in someone else's home. And you hmm. said that you were not particularly happy with that piece. Huh, on my website? Um, I think it was posted on your Instagram. Oh, yes. I think it's like the big landscape. Yes, the that ocean. was the one. Yeah. That was yeah. The one. Oh, yeah. That was really challenging. I liked painting that a lot because mm -hmm. that person wanted me to recreate something that I did before. Mm -hmm. But what I was recreating was a watercolor painting. And the new one was a, 
acrylic painting on a three by five foot panel, something like, yeah. like that. Maybe four by five foot panel. Um, and then this has never happened to me before, but he was like, oh, it doesn't look like what I thought it would look like. I don't want it in my house. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I've never this is crazy yeah luckily he did pay for most of it but yeah. it was just really awkward and I had to figure out what to do with it um that was rough actually that made me feel like really scared to do commissions for a while because I was like what if they just don't want it and I yeah spend so many hours doing this mm -hmm. like it's one thing to get paid and you know yeah. but another thing just to have it be re feel rejected but now that piece is living in my my good friend's living room and it looks yeah. really nice there and I can visit it um so it made me feel really good to have it like be in a place where it was appreciated yeah I saw it and was like it's so good it looks so good from, I mean from where it, it it is located right now and like what you said so you you're able to see it in a place where it is appreciated I guess because you know art is subjective, right? So it it's actually it, it depends on who your audience is. Just looking at the artwork, their interpretation. So yeah, and I'm glad that you that you allowed your friend to have that in in his or her place, um, and then you can visit. So that shifts mm -hmm. your perspective about the the art piece. Yeah, I don't know if it'll stay there forever, but. Yeah. He was happy to have it um, on loan. Yeah, on loan. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that I'd like to ask Eleanor, because um, I saw that you did paint the sky for, was that for a month? Daily mm -hmm. or maybe for a month? I was like, wow. Um, you did mention something about adding in some warm colors to make it sort of mirror sunset. Mm -hmm. and normally for a lot of people like myself um when i when i paint the sky it's of course it's always blue a little bit of white and you know make it fluffy and all that <laughs> um yeah. but what was what were your takeaways that's painting the sky for a month wow talk about right commitment it was like um inktober kind yeah. of challenge where people draw every day for a month and yeah. now it doesn't have to be just ink so I like to set up a challenge for myself mm -hmm. and it's really good to build up a lot of sketches and just work on something so I realized when I was doing watercolor paintings I would just the sky is looking amazing and the clouds are like so voluminous and beautiful but I couldn't capture it so mm -hmm. this was me being like let's work on this a little bit um so I learned a lot of stuff from that got a bit better at painting skies and clouds mm -hmm. so one thing I learned from that like you were saying is bringing when to bring in these different colors into the sky um depending on what you're using and depending on what time of day it is different colors really they really communicate different times of day so if you bring in a little bit of orange at the bottom, it looks like afternoon. But if you do that and you're trying to paint like early morning or noon, it just doesn't look like noon. Mm -hmm. And if you want it to be like really dusky late twilight, you can bring in some like turquoise to the sky and pink. And that shows that it's later. So just really simple things like that yeah. it might be it might be obvious but just developing that kind of language of color and seeing what communicates what was really helpful for me yeah those are really good advice i mean just adding in some doing some changes with the colors right and you mentioned different like times of the sunset um and what colors to use to make it pop or to make it mirror uh, that particular timing of the sunset so those mm -hmm. are really, really good advice um would you suggest someone because that was sky for a month right mm -hmm. and you learned a lot from it I, I think i saw from your post as well about um not touching it when it's still very wet not making any changes and all that um good paper does help mm -hmm. makes it yeah difference. um so there were things that you learned and there were also things that you have unlearned based on that experience alone. But for someone who's starting out, would you recommend that 
to focus on, on a particular subject cons- and be consistent with it mm. in order to learn something new or a technique even. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would. Because just painting the sky, for example, um, I didn't want to worry about what was happening on the ground so much. So I just got a lot more out of that because I was really concentrating on something, like basically just studying it, not trying to make like an amazing painting that I can sell on my shop or something. Um, Yeah, just keeping it in the sketchbook. The sketchbook, this is a place to just experiment and fail sometimes. And it wasn't really for anyone but me. And just seeing this whole project through is also, um, that's important to me is like finishing what I set out to do. So if it's painting 31 paintings in the month of October, then um, I'm like, I got to do this. This is so important. This is the okay. most important client ever. <laughs> Very important client. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, you are an important client to yourself, I think. I agree. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I used to see a lot of um, other artists doing that as well, like challenges um, and then collaboration with other artists as well. Um, so that's really a good way to practice uh, and learn as you go on a day-to-day basis because definitely you'll be better I mean, doing the same subjects and like playing around with it for 31 straight days yeah that is definitely a good way mm-hmm. to practice yeah learn. um let's talk about teaching because I know you did a class with us, um, a live demo and a mini workshop. And one in particular that I like is the rustic beach scene. Can you share a little bit more about that? And what were the things that you shared in that class? And of course, if you're interested to learn more about and to watch Eleanor um, did that rustic beach scene, because you'll definitely learn a lot because there are different elements within that um, painting. Then the recording is still up on the Etcher Studio website. And so go ahead and check that out. That class happened back in January. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And I also did a previous round of mm-hmm. classes with Etcher as well. You can check all those out on the website if you want. Um, So yeah, this rustic beach scene, we ended up having this focus of wanting to um, focus a composition on a figure or a character. Mm -hmm. Something I've found fun to play with in my work is the ability. So I think of it like you have like a telephoto lens. You can, you're sitting in the same place, but you can focus it on different things right um even if it's the same place the way that you frame a composition and the like the darks and midtone especially because figures really help tell a story they help um kind of like mirror us into a scene so you can feel what that person might be feeling because we're all humans and we all like relate to human imagery i think Right. I think you mentioned about the narrative. And I, I think that's a lot of, most of the time, that's something that some people miss out. I mean, especially when you're starting out, right? You just want to paint a certain, and, and then, but then it, it changes the whole um, art piece when you create a narrative um, for that art piece. And that's, it's, I think that's, if there's one thing that, that was highlighted in, in, in your work in that class, is that the composition and creating that narrative for that art piece because that will allow the audience to see themselves within that scene and I think that's very important because that will create like a a bond between the artist and whoever is looking at the art piece yeah so one other thing that I learned about you which is also very interesting and it's sort of a similar theme to the recent artists that I interviewed here on the podcast is that you're also an author of a book <laughs> I saw that um kind of yeah the um, it's Kay's car um mm-hmm. but car the, can yeah, go anywhere it can go anywhere right so mm-hmm. tell me a little bit more about that book oh my gosh so this book project was 
probably the most challenging project ever, actually. I was working with another artist and writer, Jonathan Toon, mm. who wrote the story and did the characters and the layouts. It's a young reader's yeah. graphic novel. So it's a 72 page comic book. I did the inks and um, colored it digitally. It's about a frog and a tadpole who go in an adventure in a car that goes all sorts of all sorts of places and terrains. So a lot of this, this is a great project for me because they it's kind of just like a traveling book. Yeah. So I got to draw all sorts of different landscapes. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is a great connection to what you were saying earlier. In the in the comic. The most important thing is to see what the characters are doing and make that really clear. But also I wanted to have a really rich environment that was very descriptive and specific. And it was fun to like really create this world in a way that I haven't been able to with illustration and painting because it's just mm -hmm. one image. Yeah. This is a, a whole story. So this is an amazing project. Uh, it just came out this week, actually. It's in bookstores and cool. available online, too. Okay. So it's a really exciting time for yeah. me, actually. I, I think it's also posted on your Instagram. So we, we're also going to link that. And at the same time, um, I'll have that in a mention in, in, in your intro as well. But yeah, congratulations on your book. Um, Thank when you. I saw that, wow. I think... A lot of people have that in their in their bucket list of some sort, whether you're an artist or anyone to have a book published with your name in the byline. So, mm -hmm. so that yeah. that was just released yeah. this week, right? Yes. Um. So it's a seventy-two page. Wow, that's gonna be mm -hmm. thick. Seventy-two page. Yeah, it's it's substantial. Mm -hmm. Um. But my boyfriend's four-year-old nephew was able to sit through the whole thing and then wanted it to be read again to him Aww. immediately. And he's the whole thing memorized. It's so sweet. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's all worth it now. I guess for, for, for artists, right? One thing that for most is, is to be able to see your work like published or in a gallery. And in your case, it's a book or it's, a, it's on a wall or yeah. it's you know no display or you know how did I mean personally when, when you look at your works how does that make you feel I mean um for, for other people it's so they, they find it cringe to even acknowledge that they are an artist but for someone who has been creative a maker ever since as a kid how do you view that I mean when when you look at your works um are you you tend to be very critical about it do you still see oh, I should have done this and that <laughs> or is it more of like this is by far my best work <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I think all the critical stuff comes out in the making process so by the time it's released um I'm not gonna let anything go out into the world that I'm not proud of mm -hmm. so I'm pretty proud of it when it's released this mm -hmm. book I was worried that I was gonna feel like cringy about it but yeah. I'm not I really like it okay that's good and it helps to have people who like know how to print it and install things for mm -hmm. you that make it look its best too so it's mm -hmm. also a group effort um yeah and then obviously stuff I've done several years ago I can see like oh, I would do this a lot differently now mm -hmm. but I just feel like that's, I can't expect myself to be perfect yeah. all the time. I can just be the best I can possibly be all the time. <laughs> so yeah, I do like um, take my work very seriously and mm -hmm. spend a lot of time getting it to a place that I want it to be. I work, I work a lot. <laughs> <Okay. we can laughs> that, that's good to hear. I, I think uh, from, from what I've heard so far, um, based on what you have shared, your journey, I think it's, it's the artistry and it's the, the goal that, like what you said, that you don't put out anything in the world that you're not sure that it's, you know, it's going to be received well and um, that you put your best effort in, in mm -hmm. that. And you said you work really hard. So, I wonder for anyone who is starting out, 
um, or probably because you've tried different things, right? In your journey, you you've tried different things. You also tried working for an employer, and now you are you found your niche, and um, you're doing what you love. You're you're earning from it, and I know you also have your Etsy shop, and mm-hmm. there there are different streams like paths that you have taken um, in your creative journey. But for anyone who's starting out or maybe someone who's already on the verge of trying to find out where exactly they would want to take their art to, which path they would like to take, what would be your sort of golden nuggets or pieces of advice that you can share with that person? Great. Yeah. Okay. A few things. Um, I... I'm really glad I started an Etsy shop, like you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. That was back in 2013, and it's grown every year. Um, And it gives people an opportunity to, like, own a little piece of my work that they relate to or it affects them in some way, which is great. And then it's also great because it's just a little trickle of revenue that comes in. I'm so glad I started it when I did especially because it's been almost 10 years now. Um, So I guess the best time to start something is right now. Even if you feel like it's too late, it's uh, it's not too late. And starting things, letting them not giving up is also my my other nugget because if you give up, it's definitely not going to happen. And if you don't give up, then it'll happen eventually as long as you work for it and evaluate what's going or just think critically about what you're doing constantly it's not easy but it is possible love those golden nuggets eleanor um i think it's really the starting like what you said wow 10 years almost 10 years for for your etsy shop yeah i should have a party Uh, yeah you should (laughs) just throw a party (laughs) and yeah and then for the book so Eleanor, thank you so much. And congratulations on your book and the 10th year anniversary of your Etsy shop. And um, um, for also a success- successful class, um, I know it was in January, but again, if you want to check out and learn more about um, what we talked about earlier, the beach scene, uh, if you want to learn techniques uh, and tips from Eleanor, then go ahead and check out that recording. I'll put, we'll link that into the description box. But Eleanor, thank you again for being part of Make More Art, for being part of Etcher as one of our teachers. Um, I learned so much from our conversation. And yeah, that book, I saw that. I was like, this is so adorable. Um, And, you know, for someone to to have a book with their name on it, that's really a a huge milestone. So congratulations again. Thank you so Um, much. (laughs) You're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Eleanor. Have a great rest of the day and I'll speak to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. I had the best time chatting with Eleanor and was inspired as well to learn about the different paths she took to get to where she is now. Hopefully you were inspired as well. And also to try out that 31 day challenge she did painting the sky. If you think this is helpful, give us a shout out and let us know through the comment section associated with this podcast at etrolab.com slash Eleanor. We would love to hear your thoughts, so please drop us a five-star review on the Apple Podcast or you can find us on YouTube at Etra Studio. And, oh, hitting the subscribe button is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you again next time. Until then, let's make more art.